All right, I think we're going. Yep. All right, back at it again. Um, yeah, Cal Fire Crackpots 2, climate change and water as promised, except a few days late because I couldn't get the slides together in time. How are you today? I am doing good. How about you? I am, I, I am lovely, you know. That nice, nice second episode here. We're talking about climate change and water. Um, let's get right into it with the bit that is probably a bad idea, but I'm going to go with it anyway. Fuck, shit. What's the deal with climate change? What is the deal with climate change? What, what is the deal with climate change? So it's not good. That's the first thing. But at the basic level, it's the warming of the planet because greenhouse gases are piling up like carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor too. We'll get into that. But at the basic level, greenhouse effect is when energy from the sun comes in, hits those particles, and scatters everywhere, getting absorbed into the air, rocks, basically making the whole planet warmer. Now, this is good, because if we didn't have the greenhouse effect, what would happen? If we didn't have the greenhouse effect, we'd be losing all of our heat. We, we, we'd be Neptune. No, yeah. no, Europa. That, that's the one I was thinking of. Um, yeah, there would be no heat retained in the atmosphere, and you wouldn't be able to look at memes in your phone. It's a bad existence. But unfortunately, if you've got a lot of greenhouse gases, heat piles up. And the heat piles up. You get anthrop does. anthropogenic climate change, which is no good. Unfortunately, heat has a tendency of catching more heat as well. Yeah. So, honestly, I think we should just move the moon in front of the sun all the time, like that one congressman was talking about. <laughs> did you hear about that? I did not. I don't think so. It was this one congressman. I don't remember his name. Um, mm. Who wanted to move the moon. Okay. So, okay, Republican governor, sorry, um, Republican um, Representative Louis Gomer of Texas ah. suggested at a congressional hearing that climate change could be combated by altering the orbit of the moon and asked the U.S. Forest Service official whether there were any way the agency could do it. Somehow, <laughs> I it's a really hard cope to say that instead of doing anything else that might defend or deflect climate change that disrupting the orbit of the moon would be easier so my question the, the, the funniest part of this for me was not the absurdity of moving the moon it was that he asked the u.s forest service if they could do it honey the u.s forest service can't like evacuate a stranded hiker on a cliff they can't move the moon the U.S. Forest Service is just guys in golf carts. It's either guys in golf carts or, like, a really bad fire management um, company that, like, gets immediately taken over by Cal Fire if the fire gets bigger than, like, two acres. They do the, uh, um, I see them do controlled burns every so often, which is nice, That's but, great. uh... We love those. I can't help but say that the U.S. Forestry Department isn't the guys you go to when you want to disrupt the orbit of the moon. That's right. Yeah, you're going to have to see the uh, Jewish space laser if you want to do that. <laughs> All right, moving on. The graphs. So we got a few graphs here, but first graph is the timeline of climate change. It speaks for itself. It goes from climate change is real to, okay, climate change is real. We're just not convinced it's caused by humans. To oops, to fuck. Um, it's the same copium that republicans are on and saying that you know he's not guilty but even if he is what he did was right but even if what he did was wrong it's not his fault but even if it was his fault we don't we shouldn't care to even if we should care it doesn't matter anymore i understood none of that but let, let's move on so just to get a basic idea, so carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse gas that's causing carbon, like causing the greenhouse effect. Although methane is more potent, it pretty quickly breaks down into carbon dioxide after I think it's a few years. And carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a really long time if 
you know, if not absorbed by a tree or the ocean. Um, so that's mainly what people talk about when they're talking about greenhouse emissions. And water vapor is also a greenhouse uh, gas as well, but doesn't stay in the atmosphere for very long. So this yeah. is just carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere over the last 800,000 years from uh, I think it should be Noah. I think it should be brought to attention that a lot of people say that this is one of the natural spikes. And it's true that when the, roughly the Industrial Revolution started, we were at the top of one of the spikes. If you look at this, you see this sort of deviation that it goes in between about 150 and 300 parts per million. We're at 400. That's, yeah, that's... an incredible skyrocket for no like apparent reason other years. than that we're causing climate change. 200 years in a scale of 800,000. It's a straight line up. Um, really, uh, it's not something you can quite deny when it's basically right when the Industrial Revolution happened. Now, if, say, the Industrial Revolution happened, I don't know, like 25,000 years earlier, there'd really be enough data to go off of. of but... Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, things would be warmer than they were at the start of the Industrial Revolution, but it wouldn't be just already things are warm, and then now it is a rolling boil, if you will. Yeah. All right. So this is a graph of comparing the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere versus temperature anomalies. And speaks for itself, 1880, Industrial Revolution starting in full swing. Carbon dioxide quickly followed up. And then it's just been continuing up and up and up ever since. And right now, probably a bit higher than that, but we're sitting at about 2 degrees Fahrenheit or 1.1 degrees Celsius above that pre-industrial average. And we'll get into why that number matters in a few slides, but the average temperature of the Earth going up has a lot of head consequences. And, you know, a lot of people say we're killing the Earth, um, which is kind of true. Life will carry on just fine. It might take a dip, but life will come back. It's just a matter of will humans be there to see it. The Earth might heal. Question is, will it heal with us? Yes. So then we need to ask ourselves, who is doing the emissioning? So this graph is a couple years old, but it's still a really good comparison of you know, US and China, but China very much so. A lot higher greenhouse gas emissions than really anyone else combined. And it's worth mentioning that, you know, China has three times the people as despite making up three times more population than the US, um, China makes up 27% of greenhouse gas emissions. So technically it's pulling less than its weight in climate change compared to the US, but it's, yeah. still, it's still a lot, uh, you know, China basically building cities that no one lives in just for the sake of putting people to work. Didn't they, didn't they build, um, what was it, a replica of Paris? It was like, wasn't it like the small scale model, like Despicable Me style? Yeah, um, Chen Du Cheng, which I'm absolutely butchering, is a gated community built in 2007, also known as Sky City. So even the communists aren't immune to gated communities. It has a 300 foot replica of the Eiffel Tower. Oh. Why, though? <laughs> Why? Why? Good How question. tall is the real Eiffel Tower? It can't be that much taller than 300 feet. 984 feet. That's a lot. 1,063 feet, feet. I don't tip. know what I'm on about. So it's about a third of this size. I mean, I was at the top of it, but I don't know why I hmm. thought it was 300 feet. Everything's smaller in France. That's true. So are the people. Hmm. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I don't know. This is a weird thing about France. 
is when I was in Paris, I did not see a single gym. I saw everyone smoking and everyone eating like the best food I've had in my life. But everyone like everyone was like 45 pounds. When I was in eating, Paris, like, smoking, being rude and like eating good food is the uh is the secret to good weight, but if that's the case then why doesn't it work in Appalachia? <laughs> when I was in Paris, there was a person on their um I'm not sure if you'd call them highways or freeways, but they were driving we'll pretty much straddling driving one of the lines in between lanes and as we passed them they were you know swerving back and forth reaching for a lighter <laughs> because they had a near spent cigarette on like the side of their mouth mm. and they had a new cigarette next to it that they had to light okay yeah why did they, they were just the, chaining the, cigarettes the old, the old schoolyard trick where you hold the other one up to the burning one and new one Hey, you don't need a lighter. I think he was just a noob. <laughs> anyway, let's get into who is doing the emissioning by sector. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this because it's actually pretty interesting. So you start in the middle with just the really raw makeup. So you have energy, waste, industry, and agriculture, forestry, and land use. And then you go out, and then you have you know you get energy use, transportation, and industry, and then the really granular section of the agriculture and forestry. So if you look way up here, you can see that grassland makes up 0.1% of total carbon dioxide emissions, emissions in the world. Um, so grass, basically meaning ornamental lawns. So Karen, the boomers, and their ornamental lawns literally make up a thousandth of greenhouse gas emissions which was really surprising. Huh. Um, the, the, the other thing that surprised me is how little deforestation by itself contributes. Yeah, it's just consequential factors. Mm -hmm. And then crop burning, that's a big part. Rice cultivation is, is not really a problem in itself. It's just because of how much, like how much, like how big rice is. Yeah. It's about a third of all calories consumed um, by humans is rice. Hmm. So it's, it's not that bad, considering that it makes up such a small part of agriculture in general. And then livestock and manure, that speaks for itself. You know, raising beef and really any meat contributes both methane and their farts, their food, how they get rid of their poo. And yeah. Then, and waste, you know, landfills, landfills don't really contribute a lot. Like waste in general, it's more the weight, like loss of usable materials that contributes to climate change, not really the landfill itself. At least in the U.S., there's strict regulations about um, like waste operators need to collect the methane. It's usually used for like natural gas uh, energy after that, but that number would be a lot higher if they weren't required to do that. I'm surprised that there's so much that comes from cement. Cement, yeah. Just cement specifically. So cement is twofold because the clinker, so the binder in it, uh, basically causes the chemical reaction, um, needs to be superheated. Um, I think it's like 800 Celsius. And then, you know, all the gas needed to burn to get to that, to get it to that temperature that it can become usable is its main contributing factor. And, you know, it puts off a lot of carbon as it dries. Hmm. And then, you know, this is kind of miscellaneous stuff. So, you know, boats and farming equipment. And then, you know, emissions that like really shouldn't have happened. And then, you know, this is, this is just miscellaneous stuff. And then energy use in buildings. This is, you know, heating buildings in the winter or, or cooling buildings in the summer. Um, hey, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Is that 0.4% down there for trains? Train good. Train good. Train really good. 
a train that's carrying like basically the capacity of like a thousand trucks is producing the same amount of drag. <laughs> Only problem is it has to go on the tracks and if you try using a train off the tracks uh, that, that's no good. It is no bueno. Yeah, that's that's uh that that's that's train tracks in New Jersey right now. You don't want the train to go off the tracks. And shout, shout, shout out to New Jersey for for somehow managing to get hit by a hurricane. Sometimes that muddy season be hitting though. M- muddy season do be hitting. One of my friends moved to North Carolina, um, like a couple months ago. And he sent me a text and he's like, I was not expecting that I would be less likely to get hit by a hurricane if I move if I live in North Carolina. And he moved from Manhattan. Huh. Yeah. Manhattan is how would I put it? Manhattan is not my envisionment of the best place to live. I see. He lives in Raleigh, North Carolina right now, but anyway. called a side grade. I hope I'm not doxing this person because I know they watch this. Probably not. Yeah. All right. Um. Anyway. Yeah. So you know, road transportation, trucks, cars, pretty self-explanatory. And then iron and steel. That was an interesting one, and just how much it made up. And then you know, various chemicals, paper, whatever. So yeah. You know, there's a lot of things that make it up. Some things are easier to cut out than others. You know, residential buildings and commercial heating and stuff, road transport. A lot of these big things are pretty easy to get down. Um, but things like aviation and like rail and to an extent iron and steel, a lot of those things are like pretty hard to cut out. And I see climate change as like a thing where, you know, it's easy to cut out a lot of big things, but once you get down to the really small territory, you're kind of nickel and diming things to the point where if those were the only things that were producing man-made greenhouse gas, it wouldn't really matter. Yeah, if the only thing that's producing major greenhouse gas at that point is your rice cultivation, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's like displacing the rice cultivation that's already happening might it's like a cause more even every 10 years so so this one you can take this if you'd like so i mean these are all the reasons that climate change is obviously bad so climate change you're getting lower lows and higher highs you're also getting increased droughts so then you're disrupting the natural rhythm of every so often there being wildfires that clear brush and allow new plant life to grow because it's getting drier and you're getting more droughts that are causing larger wildfires that aren't coherent with the current sort of it's it's increasing the rate of crown fires a crown fire is something that basically kills a tree most wild wildfires aren't really meant to kill strong healthy trees but crown fires which go over the crown of the tree more yeah in a way that's not supposed to happen more or less wildfires should just clear out dead plant life and some small brush if they're taking down large trees then that's going to be a fire that's large enough to clear out life rather than just rediversify the castle fire last year in southern california uh, killed 10% of the world's giant sequoia trees. Wow. Um, it was a single fire, insanely bad crown fire. Those trees are thousands of years old. They're not meant to die. <laughs> really, that, that's the big part. These trees can live basically forever. They're not meant to be killed by forest fires, is the thing. And the fact that that fire happened shows that something is happening. It's like something big is happening if these trees were able to live for thousands of years. And it was that one fire that killed them. Yeah. Additionally, you know, I had attributed a lot to climate change and also sort of the farming practices that we've fallen into, especially in America, in the Western world, where we create agricultural deserts 
that the soil and the topsoil is being used up. It's not replenishing and it's not uh, fixing nutrients into itself. So as a result, a lot of farms have to rely on techniques where, you know, where here we can do something like grow corn one season, then grow soybeans another season. A lot of times in the Amazon, what's Shire. done is they knock down sections of rainforest for farming, but soil and rainforests is notoriously bad. So they deplete the soil in a few years and have to do it all over again. Mm -hmm. And that's causing desertification and it's also causing a lot of water runoff that we haven't seen before yeah, topsoil takes a long time to generate it does like hundreds of years for a few inches so and we're seeing multiple feet just totally stripped off of the surface of the land mm-hmm And then, you know, just going on, increased disease, so either more likelihood that crossover events between animals that cause diseases, like you know, COVID, um, between whatever animals, or lab that might have caused it, um, sea level rise, obviously, uh, melting glaciers, less productive crops, uh, we were getting into that, and then conflict over scarce resources. So as fresh water becomes more scarce, as you know, food becomes more scarce, conflict's going to erupt over who gets to control these resources, right? Like who gets to build the dam that gives reduced, um, you know, uh, fresh water to a uh, country downstream. Uh, a, lot, a lot of those things can result in, result in conflict and haven't seen a too much of that yet, but it's something that could definitely become a possibility as these things get worse. So to that end, What's this podcast about? What's it about? That's a question to me. It's about water politics. Yes, it is. Just if you are here stuff. for water politics, so you have come to the right place. Let's talk about that. I hope you'd recognize this is water politics by now. Um, so freshwater sources and climate change effects. So on here, this lovely planet Earth, you know, it's, it's pretty wet and wild here. So 98% of water on Earth is salt water or brackish. You, know, you, you can't really drink that. It's, it's not going to go well. Um, and then 2% is fresh. At, at any given time, you know, it kind of fluctuates throughout the year. But that, that's kind of how it is. So the first category of freshwater sources is the biggest, glaciers and permafrost. They make up about 70% of that 2% of Earth fresh water. And the effect from climate change is fairly obvious. You know, higher temperatures cause more meltage, uh, which causes higher sea levels. And just some glaciers that are here in North America, um, you know, you have here by the Gulf of Alaska, um, a lot of glaciers that exist up there. There's one in Canada, um, pretty self-explanatory. You know, if the thing that really struck me is that basically every glacier on Earth and all fresh water everywhere melted. Like all of Antarctica was gone, all of Greenland was gone, all Arctic ice was gone. Um, the sea, all of the oceans would rise by about 200 feet. And even it's an it's a, that's not really something to worry about because even if pollution never ever ever stopped, it would basically never get to that point um yeah the glaciers you know it, very little is actually used for heat for freshwater resources for humans you know people might rely on glacier water runoff uh but it's not that big of a deal for humans i don't know anything else you want to say about glaciers um not particularly let's get to the fun part snowpack and rainfall so main source of water in the western U.S., um, so snow builds up in the winter, and then as it melts in the spring and summer, it fills reservoirs, and then those reservoirs go to farmers and cities and whatever. 
And although warmer temperatures do lead to more water in the atmosphere for like more frequent heavy rainfall, if you're getting a deluge of water, it's not like you can really use it. You're trying to get it to the ocean as quickly as possible so it doesn't, you know, swamp towns. It's basically the same reason, like, how are there still droughts in, like, the Midwest or Appalachia or something if, like, or I don't know, like, the Western U.S., if hurricanes come through every few weeks with millions and millions and millions of gallons of water. It's because when they come down, like, three inches at a time, you can't really use and store that. You need something gradual that melts throughout the year that you can depend on. Yeah, it's not a matter of getting the rain. It's a matter of keeping it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, reduced snowpack due for, from warmer temperatures means A, less predictable melting over the year, and B, because that ultimately reduced freshwater resources for humans. So the media that I have on the presentation right here is twofold. So on the uh, right here, I have a comparison of snowpack in the Sierra Nevada mountain range in California from March of 2010. March is the end of the wet season, so that's generally when you're going to have the most snowpack. And these are the same time of year, except in the middle of one of the worst droughts in California history, that being the 2010 to 2017 drought. This was at the beginning. This was at the worst of it. You know, the, the, the difference here is pretty obvious. You have a massive reduction in snowpack, um, you know, leading to cuts for farmers. What's even interesting to me is you can see how over those five years in the Central Valley, how much farmland had to be left fallow based on the color. So there yeah. wasn't enough raw to go around, so they couldn't plant food there. The bottom line is if you have 40% less water, you can only keep 40% less food. And this was from this year, uh, the snowpack. This is North Sierra Trinity, so Mount Shasta mountain ranges, and then kind of north. That's up here. And then Sierra Nevada down here. And this is the percent of normal for that time of year. 72%, um, 69, 46 in the south. That's the biggest swath of the Central Valley there, so that has a big impact. And overall, the percent of normal was 64%. This time of year, um, as of now, um, there is no snowpack in um, anywhere in the California mountain ranges right now. And to be fair, it is you know early September. The wet season is coming in a few months. But at the end of the day, you, you don't have any snow here at this time of year, which is something that really shouldn't be happening. Anything you want to say? Uh, okay. All right, freshwater lakes. Here we have a uh, little cameo of Chirac. Go Hawks. All right, so this right here is Lake Mead, uh, one of the biggest freshwater reservoirs in the Western United States. It supplies water for basically everyone in the Southwestern United States. About 40 million people depend on this. Um, as you can see from the bathtub ring, it's not supposed to be like that. Yeah, it's, this is also what a lot of reservoirs in California look like because, you know, they've been maintaining a certain level of water for so long, but then, I mean, mm -hmm. in unprecedented droughts, you just see the water level recede until there's nothing. The bath, the bathtub ring right there, um, the top of that ring was the water level in I believe 1986, it was the only time that the emergency spillway for Hoover Dam had to be used uh, for real, and that that's something super interesting because it's it was it was never been like that since then. The water level has never been that high. Um, a lot of that you depend on runoff from Colorado mountain ranges into the river. It goes south, and then after the Hoover Dam, farmers in Arizona and Colorado depend on it. Sorry. Yeah, Arizona, uh, New Mexico depend on it. The fact that I say farmers in Arizona and New Mexico, <laughs> it's just a testament to mankind's stupidity. 
Phoenix is a monument to man's arrogance. Yeah, we said that last episode. Yes, we did. It's something we need to repeat just to get people to remind you there. It's sort of a mantra now. That's right. Um, and then the Great Lakes there, uh, one of the largest freshwater systems in the world. Um, but interestingly, they only make up 0.5% of that 2% of water on Earth. Uh, hmm. But they are very important for humans for both distribution of water and storage, warmer temperatures and water cycle intensification. So, you know, lower lows, higher highs can lead to either farming of floodland along rivers, so Mississippi and Colorado, or decreased inflow and evaporation, you know, the latter being far more likely. So not only is Lake Mead here seeing reduced inflow, it's also seeing more evaporation because it's hotter. And that's not good either. And I mean, just a local story here in uh, Chicago, we got Lake Michigan. And, uh, you know, a few years ago, it was kind of all the rage that Lake Michigan was rising, um, like a lot, and kind of causing some flooding to, you know, lower lying areas on the uh, Wisconsin Peninsula. And now it's going down. So the lower lows and higher highs, Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes in general, they do have a fluctuation that fluctuation is gonna get lower and higher. So when it's at the low end of the fluctuation, it's gonna be record um, reductions in the water level and then higher highs, again, flooding those low lying areas. Yeah. So next, saltwater intrusion. This one I thought was important to mention um, because, so we got two pictures here, two important river deltas in the United States. This is the uh, Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. I, San Joaquin? Yeah, that's, that's the one. So this is San Francisco right here. This is Oakland. This is the Bay. This is the Carquinez Strait. And then this is the Delta that a lot of floodplain crops are on, like rice. And here's the Mississippi River Delta. There's the river. There's New Orleans. There's Lake Pontchartrain. And then same thing, you know, more floodplain crops there. And then a lot of people live and work in this delta for either fishing or farming. And because oceans rise, um, freshwater deltas and lakes can become undrinkable with salt water and it can't be used to irrigate crops and it reduces both usable freshwater and farmland. It's a big problem, um, you know, again, with floodplain crops like rice. And it also affects groundwater if it is over pumped due to reduced rainfall. And we'll get into that next with aquifers and groundwater. This is the last one. So, oh fuck, shit. Okay, so aquifers and groundwater, they make about 30% of that 2%, but they make up nearly 60% of water use, at least here in the States. And it's made up of, you know, underground rivers and water between rocks, and it's tapped by wells and then replenished by rainfall seeping into the ground. Because it is tied to rainfall, it's becoming more scarce as rainfall becomes more unpredictable. The benefits are that it's, you know, relatively dependable in dry years when there isn't enough surface water, but if it's overutilized over multiple dry years, uh, it can lead to saltwater intrusion by pulling that ocean water into the wells and, um, reduce supply, requiring deeper wells and more energy. And then in some cases, um, on certain water tables, if you're over pumping water, it can lead to sinkage of the land above it. So Mexico City, they pump groundwater out of right below them because it's built on an ancient uh, lake bed. And that's causing the city to sink at a really not so good rate. Do you know what the like actual sinking rate is? It's something like a foot per year or uh good question it looks like parts of the city are sinking as much as 20 inches per year that's a lot and in that's... the next century and a half they calculate according to wired that it could drop by as much as 65 feet that's an incredible amount Wow, that's that's almost twice the height of someone who shops at Brookstone. 
That's not true. Big and tall section is just big. Uh, all right, you got it. You got anything you want to say about aquifers and groundwater before we? Move um, on? I mean, it's worth bringing these up, like you said, just because they disproportionately make up a large amount of water use. But um, I mean, everyone knows what a well is. Everyone knows what groundwater is it's water in the ground simple as right. yeah. so i mean i think that's good there and then just here's some uh ones that make up just some prominent ones in the u.s you can see a lot of the midwest has it uh has a, a lot of sorry has a lot there you can take this if you want hmm? you're um You're on the same slide, Chief. Oh. <laughs> um, all right. I'm sorry, I had to stop for a second. No worries. So the political state of climate change. That's so, this is an interesting one. Yeah. Despite say. a lot of progress and even more promises by China and the G seven to cut down on emissions, um, with that sort of fifty percent benchmark by 2030 that a lot of them have totted and carbon neutral by 2050. It's unlikely that we're going to make that 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial averages that we were trying to strive with. And that's actually expected to be surpassed according to IPCC in and around the mid 2030s. So the accelerating pace that awareness and nonpartisanship are helping in climate awareness has helped that outlook a little bit compared to that report which came from 2015 although it's very unlikely that we are going to be spared sort of we're going to reap what we've sowed so that's going to be increased weather and severity in that weather drought and famine and conflict due to you know ecosystem breakdowns that's that the latter is unlikely but it's still certainly possible and you know with crops and rising need for agriculture especially with a higher population it's going to be something we'll have to look out for yeah basically just it's the 1.5 benchmark was kind of something meant to be if you don't pass that you will be unlikely to get the worst of climate change so 1.5 was kind of like at this level if you go above that enough sea ice will melt that a lot of coastal cities are going to become unusable um you know a lot of like basically a lot of extremes are going to happen to make some areas for farmland and previously inha inhabitable areas uninhabitable but, you know, it's unlikely that the goal is going to be reached, unfortunately, but it, it's we're not quite fucked yet. Um, and that leads yeah. me to my next slide here. <laughs> we're fucked, kind of. Um, this is a continuation to the um, This is Fine comic. Just give that a look for a second. I think I, that one hits a little bit too on the nose, but my only advice for you is... Don't be a doomer. It's not helpful. You are no more useful than the boomers who deny climate change if you say there's nothing I can do. We're all fucked anyway. It's um, those two outlooks that are, you know, they discourage climate uh, change action yeah, to yeah. say, oh, you know, we've already gotten past one degree Celsius above pre-industrial. It doesn't matter anymore. We may as well just throw in the towel for the human race. That's the same outlook as, oh, it doesn't matter. My great, 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 great grandchildren are going to be the only people that need to care about it. Mm -hmm. That's It's stupid. Yeah. Uh, Live in the real that, world. You hear that it's ongoing. You hear that, millennials? Don't, don't do that. I'm sorry. That's a bad idea. But I think that's about it for today. And our next episode is on line three, Tar Sands Suck. So I'm sure you've heard about defund line three, you know, cutting through Native American 
reservations being a last ditch attempt for the fossil fuel industry and all of the lovely banks who are funding it. All of that and more on the next episode of Calfire Cried Bots. Yep, we will see you then. We will. And any any shout outs before we go? Shout out to you know the climate. Shout out to Climate's the- been a bad bitch. It has. She don't, do don't, not don't need no that. man. Don't don't say that. What do you mean? It, it, it's it's not a good idea. Not a good idea. Don't give the R three four artists any fuel. <laughs> they don't need it. They already have enough. Don't say these things. You're saying things that I wish you wouldn't. Lovely. All right. I think that's it. Yeah. Goodbye, everyone. Ciao.